Check. I'm checking the microphone. <laughs> I'm not check at all. I'm half Czech and the other half German. Turn this down. Airplane mode. I just turned mine off entirely. Welcome everyone out there on Facebook and YouTube. My name is Dan Clements. I'm the education manager here at Imagination Station, and we are back with our Bug a Scientist series. Jack and Heidi are here. They are ready to tell us all about bugs, and we are very excited to throw it to them. So without any further ado, let's get started. Hi everybody, I'm Heidi. And I'm Jack, and we are entomologists. <laughs> So, Jack, you and I love insects, mm -hmm. but why should anyone else care about them? Well, the number one reason is there are so darn many. I mean, it's incredible. Look at that number. That's a 10 with 18 zeros. Whoa. 10 quintillion. I don't even, can't even imagine that. Uh, that's how many insects, individuals, there are on the Earth. Uh, that's about, um, well, I don't know. One, one and a half billion insects for each human. And in Ooh. fact, as it turns out, um, <clears throat> if you took all the ants in the world and weighed them, the ants in the world weigh more than the humans in the world. No way. Even though they're, you know, each of them is tiny, huh. there are so many that they outweigh us. So <clears throat> the other thing about them is that there are so many kinds. Uh, there are about 6 million species of insects, but scientists estimate that they've only found about 1 in 5, maybe 20%. Uh, and if you use that number, the scientists who work on the count insect species feel that there may be as many as 30 million species of insects. Now that number is way more than any other kind of organism on the planet except maybe bacteria, but we don't know what a bacterial species is really. So <clears throat> that means that in terms of animals, three out of every four animals is an insect. 
And three out of every five animals is an insect. So they dominate. I mean, it's the insect's world, and we only live in it. <laughs> we kind of borrow. We borrow space, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Uh, except for the ones that live with us, you know. <laughs> but there are a lot of pest insects, right? Well, no, 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 let's not be too harsh. Only about 1% of all insect species cause one or another kinds of trouble. That said, it is true that some of them do cause some pretty significant trouble. Uh, in particular, um, several of the insect species, and it's not that many of them, uh, transmit diseases to humans, <clears throat> about 20 altogether. Uh, and in this, uh, this collection of baddies here, uh, the mosquito is probably the, the nastiest of, of all. Oh. And the reason for that is that the mosquito transmits lots of different kinds of diseases, uh, and one of which is really bad uh, is called malaria. <clears throat> the, uh, when I say mosquitoes, I have to you know, rush to tell you that different species of insects transmit different diseases. So the insects in your backyard are not the species of insects that transmit malaria. Uh, those species of, um, <coughs> of mosquitoes live in more tropical areas. Um, <coughs> However, as late as 1945, the malaria mosquitoes did live in your backyard. In fact, at the end of the 19th century, malaria was still a major cause of deaths in the US in places as far north as Manhattan. Uh, so it's all about habitat. Mosquitoes need a relatively warm place and lots of water because their juvenile uh, forms live in, in streams and lakes. And that's why in a very wet spring, you'll have more insects around because they found lots of water to breed, breed in. The reason that malaria is such a big problem is that we don't really have a good cure for it. And 200 million or 220 million people are infected anew each year, and 400,000 people die of malaria each year. It's one of the, uh, the worst diseases that humans experience. Most of that is occurring in Africa, uh, but we don't really have an answer to uh, malaria except killing mosquitoes uh, anywhere in the world. <clears throat> uh, so many people in some African countries are sick of malaria at one time that the labor, there's a labor shortage uh, and it's difficult to farm or get other work done. So it's a, it's a major economic impact as well. Uh, something to think about is that as the climate changes and parts of the U.S. get wetter and warmer, it's likely that the ma malaria mosquitoes will begin moving north and we'll see them uh, more commonly in northern states than we did before. The main control here has been DDT, but then we learned that DDT has negative outcomes. So it's not immediately clear what we're going to do about that. So that's probably the worst of those diseases, although there's another one that historically has been even worse, at least over short periods of time, and still exists, right? Yes, and it's all due to fleas. Fleas on these guys. On rats, and it was fleas on rats that transmitted bubonic plague or the Black Death. These rats came into Europe on ships in the middle of the 14th century and caused an epidemic that killed over 200 million people in Europe, half of the population of Europe at the time. And these uh, epidemics occurred on and off for 600 years until about um, yeah, kind of trickled out, and there was no cure at the time. Only, only thing you could do was to isolate yourself if you had the luxury of doing that, or to wear masks. Does that sound familiar? It's um, very familiar, except that a rat's not involved. We have a virus that we're spreading around, and the best, best defense is to stay away from other people, just like the bubonic plague, mm -hmm. and wear a mask, mm -hmm. just like the bubonic plague. Yeah. Uh, and that's what people did. It's called the bubonic plague because these spots that you see on people are swollen lymph glands that swell up, turn dark, and burst. Those are called buboes. And that's where the disease gets its name. 
And as Heidi said, the disease is transmitted by fleas jumping off of rats onto people, and really all people could do was get away from infected people. And some wore crazy masks, like that one in the upper <laughs> yeah. left-hand corner there. Uh, that nose was actually meant to uh, control the odor of dead and dying people. Uh, people wearing those used to put herbs and spices and flowers in the nose to kill the odor. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that's yeah. a little creepy. We're very lucky that we discovered antibiotics and that can treat any of the cases of Black Death or bubonic plague that come up now. People occasionally mm -hmm. catch it from, mm -hmm. from fleas on various kinds of rodents. Even woodchucks can carry the, those fleas. But antibiotics are pure that right away. It's, uh, we really got that under control pretty mm -hmm. much. There are other unpleasant things that we can encounter with insects. Mm -hmm. uh, insects eat many of the same things we do. And in fact, if you think about it, they sort of compete with us for food. Yeah. Uh, as you, you'll hear uh, next time, uh, half of all insect species eat plants. And uh, if those insect species aren't very abundant, they don't eat much, but particularly in agricultural settings, they can get so abundant that they eat all of the plants. And here is a, a plague of locusts in northern Africa. Uh, this happens every few years depending on the weather. In fact, the kind of weather that leads to outbreaks of these grasshoppers uh, is the kind of weather we expect to see more of with climate change. There can be more than a billion or two billion grasshoppers in one of these clouds, one of these uh, huge swarms, and they eat everything in sight. When they invade an agricultural field, there's really nothing to be done except spray pesticides, but it's hopeless. You can't possibly spray enough to get all these grasshoppers. They just roll across the countryside, people trying to chase them away, and when they're finished eating, there isn't much left. They completely wipe out agriculture in northern Africa countries. So that's a really scary, scary thing. I, you know, on the one hand, it's like a tornado. I've always wanted to see that, but I'm not sure I want to be in it. You know? No. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but it's really spectacular to, to see something like that. Evidently, when the insects run out of plants, they start eating the laundry on, on the line in the yeah. backyard and pants of, off of people. So it's really incredible. And right now, we don't know how to control them. No, no. Mm -hmm. uh, it's futile right at the moment because you just can't... You, I mean, you can spray insecticides, but you can't kill hardly enough of them yeah. at all. Yeah. Uh, some insects eat wood as well, and you're probably familiar with that. Um, termites are a good example. That fat lobby thing at the top here is a termite queen. Whoa. Yeah, she's, <laughs> see how much bigger she is than the rest of the termites yeah. in the nest? Mm -hmm. She lays 30,000 eggs per day. In fact, that's all she does is lay eggs. That's why she's so big. She's producing 30,000 eggs a day or 11 million eggs in a year. Whoa, that's some motherhood. Uh, I'm telling you, <laughs> she must be tired, I would think. But, yeah. but actually, a termite uh, queens can live for 20 years, so that's really a lot huh. of eggs. Yeah, just imagine. But these uh, termites aren't actually digesting the wood. They are getting help from microbes, bacteria, and other microbes in their guts, which break down the wood uh, and recover the nutrients for the, for the termites. And here the, the story turns a little towards the positive. As is true in many cases with insects, they may do some bad things, but they also make some positive contributions. Uh, scientists are acting, uh, are researching very hard to try to get control of the microbes and termite guts to digest wood, tree wood, to make paper. If you go in a, into a restroom and you see the, uh, that the paper towels are brown, that means that they were, the wood was not completely broken down in the process using acid. These microbes break the wood down into absolutely the, the lowest possible molecules and would be great for making paper in a more environmentally sound way. So that's one possible contribution. And the other is that um, uh, some, some uh, termites make these very large termite nests or mounds. 
Uh, I'm admiring this one in Australia. And uh, when they do that, they, they turn over the soil in such a way that they actually improve the soil around the nest. Uh, they contribute nitrogen and they, they recycle nutrients in such a way that they're actually a positive impact on the environment. So again, as I said, there are both positive and negative contributions that insects make to our lives. Well, they aren't all bad, right? I mean, some of them are just beautiful. Well, you know, we're entomologists. <laughs> but I think even to someone who isn't an entomologist, uh -huh. look at those colors. Yeah. That, uh, that butterfly at the top is the world's largest butterfly. Uh, the wingspan is about eight inches. Uh, it's called the bird wing butterfly. It occurs in Asia. But you've got to admit, it's gorgeous. I mean, even if you don't like bugs much, <laughs> you know. And then yeah. there are fireflies. Uh, the fireflies will probably be out in your backyard unless you live on the West Coast pretty soon. Um, and, you know, this, just the sheer beauty of insects is really impressive. And uh, you don't have to be an entomologist to think these are cool. <laughs> right. <laughs> so they, they, you know, contribute sort of, uh, you know, aesthetically to our lives, but they also provide lots of different services. They do. And one of the most important to us as humans are the pollinators. And we have here at the Imagination Station an actual hive. And there's a connection to the outdoors, and the bees can come in and out, and they forage outside, and they come back into the hive, and there's a side that's actually open so that you can come and visit and watch them do what they do. You now, can actually watch them come and go out the window here. It's really yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so unlike most insects, who are, which are pretty solitary except for mating, uh, honeybees and many other bees and wasps are truly social. There's a queen and there are workers that have various jobs. This is true for the termites too, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And like the ants and wasps and termites, they're all female. Males are around only once a year for mating. And like the termites, there's a queen who is very large and her only job is to lay eggs. Now, she, her egg laying may pale in Maybe comparison so. to the termites. Would you say 20, 30,000 a day? Yeah, yeah, a bee was about 2,000 a day. Two, right? yeah, yeah, 2,000, yeah. But, but that's still a lot. Um, other bees are workers that clean the hive. Others cool the hive with water that's brought in from the foragers. And then there are the foragers who leave the hive to search for flowers, to collect nectar and pollen that they bring back to feed the larvae. And they, um, we're going to show you a close-up of what that looks like. So in those cells, the ones on the right, you can see the, the the short whitish thing, that's the egg that's been laid by the, by the queen. By the queen. She and goes around and around putting those in there, right? Yeah. yeah. And then to the left are eggs that have hatched in our larvae at different stages of development. And those will be fed a mixture of, of nectar and pollen uh, that's custom made by the bees in the hive and to those, feed them. Those six-sided chambers there, is is that wax? Bees make that yeah. out of wax? Yeah. yeah. Boy, they're very regular, aren't they? I mean, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And in commercial beehives, like the one behind us, mm -hmm. the racks, the base is provided by the beekeeper, and then it forms, lays the mat for the initial pattern, and then the bees are laying that on top. Let's see, let's look at the live cam. Cool. And so here you can see the bees moving around, and you can see that lattice, which is provided by the, the frame of the bee hive. And then the, the bees are moving around, interacting with each other, exchanging chemical signals. And you can see the long column of wax and cells that have already been filled with eggs and larvae. This is a brand new baby hive, right? Brand new. Yeah. And that's why we're only seeing that one whitish person uh, part of, of the hive. But throughout, as the season progresses, throughout the summer, 
all three tiers of this will be completely filled with wax and eggs and larvae and lots and lots of bees. Thousands of bees in a, in a hive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we've been talking so far about the European honeybees, which are raised commercially so that they can pollinate our crops. But there are lots of other native pollinators that perform really important pollination services for many native plants. You can see a selection of them here. Ooh. And they come in different shapes and sizes. You can see the pollen collected on the one on the bottom right. But they form a, a really important uh, ecosystem role for plants. So that pollen is exchanged. And they also need places to live. So <laughs> they need holes or burrows in which to put their eggs. And you can actually help them out with artificially made bee houses, native bee houses. This happens to be one that's available in the Imagination Station gift shop, but there are lots of other examples that you can find online. And it's a great thing to have in your backyard to help out the native bees. And it's also really fun to watch because you can watch the bees going in and out and, and they'll eventually uh, lay eggs in there and then close up the opening. And just think, you'll be a parent of new bees popping out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mentioned how important pollination is, um, and the, really, many of the foods that we take for granted being available to us at the grocery store or the farmer's market would no longer be available. This slide shows you, this picture shows you what it would be like. The top level is when pollinators are happy and healthy and doing their job, and the bottom shows you what the grocery store would look like if we lost all of our European honeybees. And this has been a, a concern because there have been diseases that have been going through bee colonies for several years. Um, and so there's a lot of concern and a lot of research going on in ways to control those pathogens in the beehives so that our grocery stores always look like the top picture and not the bottom one. People may not realize this, but <clears throat> carrying beehives around the country in semi-trailer trucks is the way many of our crops are pollinated. Uh, people who own thousands of beehives move them in huge trucks from, say, Arizona to California when a crop there is flowering and needs, needs to be pollinated. So uh, this is an incredibly important service. It's another kind of migrant worker. Yeah, it is. That, that's right. That we're very dependent on. That's right. Well, there are some other important services that, that insects provide. And we might not think of them originally, but they're at least as important as pollination because we would be up to our chins in decaying material. Dead it, stuff? Dead stuff if insects didn't take care of that. This is the... Uh, the American burying beetle, and it's called a burying beetle because a male and a female find a dead animal, carry it away, and excavate uh, the soil underneath the animal until it's buried as deep as two feet below the surface of the ground. If they didn't do that, a huge number of, of animals dying in our world would be lying around rotting. Uh, and so this is a really important service. This beetle, by the way, is uh, endangered and there are many programs involved in reintroducing it to various Midwestern states. Kind of an unglamorous job. Very unglamorous, and it's stinky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they really, even holding these beetles is really more than I can take. It's really <laughs> not all that much fun. And there's another kind of waste that uh, we don't often think of. Uh, but here's an example of how important this service is. <clears throat> uh, African, there are about 500,000 African element, elephants. They together produce about 50 million pounds of dung poop each day. Whoa! 50 million pounds each day. And by the next day, all 50 million pounds are gone. How is that? Disappeared. So they start over, right? <laughs> Pooping again. And the reason for that is that the, the, the poop is rolled up into balls and carried away and buried by 
dung beetles. And you see a busy dung beetle in the lower right there rolling her ball off to bury it in a tunnel she's already made. Uh, if she didn't do this, just imagine how much elephant dung there would be. You couldn't, you couldn't go through the national parks in Africa without, I mean, you'd be buried in dung without these beetles. So there must be lots and lots and lots of those beetles. Oh, a huge number of beetles. And the national parks and other countries in Africa fully understand the importance of this because, as you can see on the left, uh, it is not legal to run over a dung beetle. Uh, you're subject to a fine. Uh, and in fact, you're not, you're not allowed to run over either elephant dung or dung beetles because the balance of the two, there's not enough dung for them to roll into a ball. There won't be enough beetles, and if there aren't enough beetles, there'll be too much dung. So this is all tightly regulated and is even, uh, even has laws applying to it. Oh my goodness. Yeah, the beetles, <laughs> the beetles were really important to the Egyptians. They were, and in fact, I'm wearing a, a scarab of a dung beetle. Yeah, dung beetles are scarabs, that's yeah. what they're called, yeah. And the idea was, is that the, the sun rolls across the sky during daylight, and it rolls across the sky because a dung beetle is rolling it. That's what the Egyptians believe. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. It's yeah, a great myth. Cool, cool idea, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's uh, one other important uh, waste disposal system, and that is flies. Everybody familiar with having maggots in their garbage cans sometimes? I remember when I was a kid, that Ew. used to happen all the time. I used to have to go clean them out. Anyway, <clears throat> those maggots are consuming waste, mostly organic waste, plant and animal waste, uh, and they do so very efficiently. Uh, some people are in business of recognizing that by developing maggot farms or fly farms to take waste material, garbage, uh, and let billions of fly larvae feed on them. Uh, the result being fly larvae and other products that are nutrient rich. So this is a fly farm in Ohio. Uh, this fly farm raises billions of a uh, kind of fly called a soldier fly. that They don't bite or cause disease or anything. All they do is degrade garbage. And after they've grown up to a certain size, the, uh, the Maggots are uh, killed and ground up, and pure protein is extracted from them. Uh, <clears throat> and the, in this case, about eight and a half billion flies consume 250 tons of organic waste a day. And it's all turned into protein-rich cattle feed. Huh. Uh, this has gotten to be very popular. There's a, there are fly farms in every state and several of them in Ohio. So and I guess it's very profitable. But it's a great idea using a natural you know, waste disposal system to turn it into a, a useful product. Insects as the master recyclers. They are, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's not only food for cattle that insects can provide, but they also provide food for a lot of native animals, especially birds. There's a bird. <laughs> There's a chickadee <laughs> bringing a big fat caterpillar back to the nest. Yeah, this to feed is its nestlings. This is so important that people have shown that if you um, <clears throat> keep birds from catching enough caterpillars, they don't produce as many babies. And if you really? keep, and if you keep birds from catching caterpillars, the caterpillars eat more plants and do more damage. Huh. So birds are, you know, important in the system. And without caterpillars, things would be bad. Yeah, so birds are actually some natural insect control, too. They are. Mm -hmm. Right? Another mm -hmm. reason why the world is still green. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Now, who else eats insects? <laughs> People eat insects. And here's, here's some insects that I ate in Ecuadorian Amazon. It's called chontacura, and those are quite alive. <laughs> actually, they're served either alive or fried, and they are larvae from a palm beetle, and a very important wilderness food, and on the long hunts that's, that some of the indigenous populations go on, it's one of their major sources of protein. They are fairly tasty once you get past the view. Gooshiness. Of them, gooshiness. But humans eating insects is becoming more and more common, and there are huge numbers of 
people in the world. We think two billion or more, which include insects as a regular part of their diet. No. And you can, and there are, you can buy these cricket bars in stores or order them online. Cricket protein bar. Comes in three flavors. I want I want the blueberry one. Blueberry vanilla, okay. Peanut butter and jelly or coconut. <laughs> and you can also buy them freeze dried. So here's a bag of mixed bugs, ready to eat, mixed bugs seasoned with salt. <laughs> now you've made things with cricket flour, right? I have the cricket flour and we've dipped crickets in chocolate to make chocolate chirpies and we've um, pan-fried mealworms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there are lots of ways to prepare insects that are actually pretty tasty. Yeah. We'll have to do an event someday we for should, that. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, finally, it seems to me that you may be wearing an insect product today. Me? In fact, in fact a caterpillar product. Is that right? <laughs> yes, indeed. This is a silk shirt. And silk comes from caterpillars. From this caterpillar. From the cocoons they make. This is a silk moth caterpillar eating a mulberry leaf and draped across a series of cocoons. There, here's a, here are a couple that I brought back from Korea. This silk fiber in my shirt comes from unwinding the cocoons. And there are several thousand feet of silk per cocoon. Think about that. 7,000 feet from this little cocoon. There are actually machines that unwind, unwind, it. unwind that, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So about 70 million pounds of raw silk are produced every year, which requires about 10 billion cocoons. It's a big industry uh, originating in China, but now common throughout Asia. But that, that caterpillar, those caterpillars are maintained in culture just like animals. I mean, like yeah. cows or something, right? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We bred them, really, right. mm -hmm. to do this. So, you can see that while some insects are harmful to us, many more are helpful and even indispensable to us. Insects are making positive as well as negative contributions to our lives. And frankly, we can't live without them. That's right, yep, <laughs> yep. Next week, we'll explore insects versus plants which is a contest that impacts our daily lives in surprising ways. Think about why you drink coffee. Hmm. Just stay awake. Yeah, right. Anyway, see you next week, same time, same place. Take care. Bye. I can't. Yeah, <laughs> it was a little...